Inspired by the life of the savvy and ambitious Colombian businesswoman Griselda Blanco comes a new Netflix original limited series. Griselda tells the story of a devoted mother who, with her lethal blend of charm and relentless savagery, creates one of the most powerful cartels in history. Witness Sofia Vergara's captivating transformation into the godmother of the underworld. Griselda, now streaming only on Netflix. We always talk about pickup lines. Is there a better way to approach it than another. When people start using these corny, cheesy things, the what's your sign and the sort of nagging approach. Some guys do this where they try to lower a woman's self-esteem right. relative to theirs, thinking that that's going to make her more likely to say yes. Those things don't work. They're universally rated as, as being very poor pickup lines. And it's just the simple approach, the high hello, showing interest, and then also a compliment, saying something nice about the other person. Hey, it's Dr. Phil. This is Relationship Reality Check. Last week, we were talking about sex. Yep, we got sexy last week. We talked about fantasies. We talked about porn. We talked about sex toys. We talked about all the kind of things that you just don't talk about in polite society. So if you missed that one, you want to listen to it because it can be very freeing if you give yourself permission to talk about those things. But now we're back to talking about real intimacy. And what I'm going to ask you to do today is some serious self-examination, looking for something that resides within every one of us. And it's what I call your bad spirit, the bad spirit that resides within every one of us. So what do I mean by bad spirit? We talked about myths, right? You remember we went through the myth busting, which I said I love so much, when we can blow up things that people have been laboring under for so long. That's one way you can really poison your relationship, but there are other ways you can do it. Today, I'm talking about one of the biggest ways you can ruin a relationship, and that is when something I call your bad spirit takes over. Now, first off, let me tell you what brings out what I call your bad spirit in a relationship. Everything you do with somebody you care about is magnified. The gravity is increased. The power of those interactions take on a whole different moment to them. They take on so much more leverage to get you feeling one way or another than they do with somebody you're not emotionally involved with, someone you're not intimately involved with. Why? Because you care what this person thinks. If your partner criticizes you, if your partner rejects you, if your partner's not interested in you, that matters a whole lot more than if the clerk down at the grocery store rejects you, right? You don't care so much what they think because you don't have a lot invested in that person. You haven't told yourself, I need this person's acceptance, this person's approval. You never stood in the line down at the Piggly Wiggly and looked at the clerk and said, you complete me. That's what you hear in the movies, but that's not what you say in the grocery store line. That's what you say about the person that you have convinced yourself you're going to spend the rest of your life with. So when that person starts taking your inventory, when that person finds something wrong with you, when that person starts getting critical, when that person has issues, that really matters to you because you have so much invested in their acceptance and approval. And they have so much invested in your acceptance and approval of them. So what are the characteristics of the bad spirit? Well, a bad spirit is immature. A bad spirit has a low emotional age. They don't function at a mature adult-to-adult -adult level. They have an emotional age that is much younger, like teenage, emotional age of 14, 15, 16. And what does that mean? One thing you can say about teenagers is they want what they want when they want it, and they want it right now. They're not much on delayed gratification. They're all about immediate gratification. They want the things that they want right now. They don't want to wait. They don't want to work. They don't want to defer. They want everything right now. They're selfish. Your bad spirit can be very controlling. My way or the highway. They're power-seeking. 
The bad spirit can be immature, selfish, controlling, and power-seeking. And then there are some other characteristics that I'm going to talk about with much greater specificity. Now, it's not much fun to take a look at yourself along these lines, but it's like I've said before, you cannot change what you do not acknowledge. And if your relationship isn't everything that you want it to be, then you've got to be willing to take a look and ask yourself, what can I change about me to inspire something different in this relationship? I'm not asking you to figure out how to fix your partner. The reason I'm not is because you can't do that. You can't fix your partner. Only your partner can fix your partner and only you can fix you. So we'll talk about how you interact with your partner later on. But right now, I want you to ask yourself if your bad spirit is invading your relationship and making it impossible for your partner to feel free, safe, spontaneous, and uninhibited around you. Now, the number one characteristic that your bad spirit is going to show in a relationship is being a scorekeeper. Being a scorekeeper. Now, what do I mean by that? Look, I've talked about this before. You don't want to be competitive in your relationship. And I need to distinguish this for you. People that are in a relationship that is fun and spontaneous, they often banter back and forth. They'll tease each other. He'll gig her a little bit and she'll gig him a little bit. They just go back and forth with that. And it just seems like they're trying to kind of stay sharp with each other. But there's a difference between teasing somebody and being mean-spirited. When you're a scorekeeper, it's like everything is tit for tat. If I do A, you owe me B. I always cringe when I hear a couple say, I picked the kids up last night, so it's your turn tonight. You went out to the gym last night, so tonight's my night. I get to do something. That's scorekeeping. When you start keeping score, that means there's going to be a winner and a loser. And you've heard me talk about winners and losers before. Crush the Lions, kill the other team, smash the opponents. You don't want to do that because you're talking about the person you love. You don't want your partner to be a loser in competition with you. You want both of you to be winners. You want to put every relationship you have on a win-win basis, not a win-lose basis, a win-win basis. So when you get competitive and it gets into real competition between partners because you're scorekeeping, it's really tit for tat, that's bad news. That's your bad spirit taking over. Look, true intimacy is not a game. True intimacy is marked by acceptance, selflessness, giving, support, not entitlement, not what you owe me. And when I see couples that are in this scorekeeping tit for tat sort of thing, you know what I see? I see people that don't want to accept a gift from their partner because they know with that gift comes obligation. It's like, no, 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 I don't want you to be okay with me going to the gym tonight because I know that's going to cost me. I don't want you being all understanding about me getting home late from work because I know that's going to be very expensive for me because I know you're a scorekeeper and you're going to hold that over my head forevermore. So you see couples that are really scorekeepers where one or the other is afraid to accept a gift, afraid to accept an accommodation from their partner because they don't want the obligation. Uh-uh, I don't want to owe you. No, sir. Don't want to do it. Don't want it. Just, uh-uh. No, thank you, because they know there's a price and they don't want to pay it. They get really afraid for that to happen. So in short, competitiveness between partners is an ill wind that can blow through an otherwise healthy relationship. You want to stay away from that. And I'm going to give you some things that you can really think about to measure whether or not you are a scorekeeper. Number one. You tend to keep score of things your partner does 
such as leisure time, outings with friends, how many hours they put in with the children, or chores that were completed. If you're really keeping track of that, you're setting them up. And that's when I say they don't want to do all of these things because they don't want to be obligated. Number two, you make sure your partner never gets the upper hand and never gets by with a freebie. If they get to do something, you get to do something. They don't ever get a freebie because a freebie would be out of balance. You wouldn't want that because you're a scorekeeper. Number three, You bank points which are held over your partner's head for leverage. It's like, boy, I took her to her mother's this weekend. Boy, did I build up some points. I really built some points up. She's going to owe me now. When I want to go play poker Thursday night and not come home till Friday afternoon, she owes me. Oh, that's so unhealthy. Four, you make concessions in a negotiating fashion, rather than offering them up as a gift of support. So you make a concession, but it's like, okay, I'll give you this if you give me that. Okay, I'll go here if you'll go there. I'll do this if you let me do that. Look, it's okay to define things. I'm not saying that you have to say yes to everything because you don't want to define your relationship. I can remember very early on in my relationship with Robin, we weren't even married yet, but we were close. And she called me one day on the phone and she said, hey, will you take me to my sister's house? And it was just across the state line. This is about an hour and a half drive. And I said, "Uh, yeah, sure. And I hung up the phone and thought, I don't want to do that. I I don't want to go up there. I don't know those people. I don't want to know those people. I don't want to make a three-hour round trip to go see some people that don't want to see me. They want to see her. And I called her back and said, you know what? I don't really want to do this. And there's no point in me doing this now because I'm not going to do it later. So if I do it now, it would be like bait and switch. It's like, before we get married, I'll take you to your sister's house. Then we get married, and I'll say, no, I don't want to go to your sister's house. You're going to say, you know what? You did all that when you were dating. Then as soon as we get married, you don't want to go. I don't want that to happen. I want to tell you now. I don't want to drive you up to your sister's house. And here's something else. I'll never ask you to go to my sister's house either. Can we just agree that we won't do that to each other? Now, if she needed a ride somewhere, of course I would take her. I'd take her anywhere. I'd take her to the moon and back. That wasn't the point. The point was going to her sister's house when they weren't excited about me coming. They didn't even know me. They just sort of knew me. They didn't really want to spend time with me. They wanted to spend time with her. They loved her. I would just be in the way. At first, she said, well, I don't know. Let me think about that. And then she thought about my sisters, and she said, you know what? This is a pretty good train right here. And we've laughed about it a million times, but it was really something about just being transparent. It wasn't a negotiation. It was just being honest. Had she wanted me to take her, knowing how I felt, if it was that important to her, I would have taken her. Because I've always had a rule. If I don't want to do something And on a scale of one to 10, I don't want to do it at a two. And she wants to do it at an eight. Like not doing, it's not really that big a deal to me. I just kind of don't want to do it. And she really wants to do it. I just think an eight always outweighs a two. And she's very much the same way. You know, she may not want to go ride around the golf course with me on a Sunday afternoon, but she kind of doesn't want to go at a two. I might really want her to go at a level eight because I want to show her the new layout or something that I think she would really like and enjoy. Then she'll say, yeah, sure. Yeah, I'll go. I'm Katie Maloney, 37, a divorcee, and I'm out here falling in love every day with myself. And I'm Dana Kathan, 33, former needy mess and delusional Leo, but I've never been happier. Never been happier. You know that. Good. (laughs) The foundation of this podcast is for people who want to live their life unapologetically. It's a safe space for anyone who's going through a transition in their life or just dealing with the regular bullshit. It's a religion. We're not saying that we're looking to start a coven, but that might be why we started this podcast. I'm not saying that. Join our cult. I mean, community. I mean, the coven. Religion. Let's just stick with community. 
Listen to the podcast. Listen to the podcast. <laughs> so I always just try to read my partner and be honest with myself. It's not a matter of tit for tat. It's just a matter of trying to read each other and deciding what's important to each other at a given time. Number five, you seldom, if ever, do something in support of your partner without making sure he or she knows it, including a detailed explanation of the imposition it created for you. I did this, but you need to understand how much I gave up to do this. You need to understand how hard it was for me, how much I skipped to do this, the price I paid to give you what you want. And the only reason you would want to make sure that they knew that is because you were going to exact something in return. Again, because you're keeping score, so you need all of the points on your side of the ledger you can get. Number six, in any type of dispute or confrontation with your partner, you Actively seek outside allies in the form of family and friends in an effort to shift the balance of power. And you always know this is happening when instead of saying, here's how I feel, sometime in that conversation you'll say, well, your mother agrees with me, your brother agrees with me, all of our friends say the same thing. So, okay, now you've got a team You're calling in the SWAT team here because you want to win so bad, so you've got to get reinforcements. There's two things that drive me crazy, and it's somebody that does reference selling. You know what reference selling is? It's when somebody knocks on your door and say, hi, I'm here to sell you this vacuum system, and I'm here because Mrs. Jenkins on the corner and Mrs. Olson down the street, they told me to come see you because they love it. That's reference selling. They're selling you by reference to people that you trust. That's what's happening when a scorekeeper starts naming other people. Your mother agrees with me. Your dad sees it exactly the same way. The kids are all on my side. I think that is such unfair fighting. The other thing that drives me crazy is when somebody is always quoting someone. They're always quoting some author, Voltaire says, or Plato said, the Chinese proverb is, Scripture says, I mean, come on, do you not have an original thought? Do you not have enough confidence in yourself to stand on your own two feet? You've got to cite some higher authority in every conversation you have. Have original thought. Own your own thinking. Drives me crazy. So now you're not bringing in family, you're bringing in world-class philosophers, ancient thinkers to get the upper hand. And last, but certainly not least, and I save this one for the end, you insist on having the last word or doing the final act of defiance. You just can't leave it alone. You just can't. You got to have the last word. You know why? Because you're keeping score. And if they get in the last punch, then you're behind. So you've got to get in the last shot. You got to get in the last word. I used to joke with Robin that I could never get in the last word because if I got the last word, that was just the first word of the next argument. We were joking, but you don't want to do that. You don't feel the need to have the last word. Leave it alone. You're not keeping score and your goal in a disagreement, like I said before, should not be to win. It should be that you have been listened to. You have been heard, H-E-A-R-D, not H-U-R-T. You have been heard and just leave it at that. Ask yourself, do an examination of your relationship. Are you a scorekeeper? And the best way To find it is use those seven, and I'm going to put those seven on the website so you can look at them and ask yourself, do I do those things? Do you keep score of things your partner does? Do you make sure your partner never gets the upper hand? Do you bank points so you can cash them in later? You make concessions in a negotiating way instead of just giving a gift, no strings attached. Do you seldom do things in support of your partner without making sure they know how much it costs you to do it? In any type of dispute, do you seek outside allies so you can fill up the bleachers on your side? And do you always try to get the last word? If those things describe you, then your bad spirit is expressing itself 
by making you a scorekeeper. Don't do that. The second characteristic of the bad spirit is you're a fault finder. You're a fault finder. You just tend to look for the negative no matter what's going on. And it's real easy to find if you're somebody that uses two words in your vocabulary an awful lot. Guess what they are? Should and must. Well, you should do it this way. Well, you must come over here and do this. Well, you should have told her, well, you should come here and do this. Well, you should do it that way. Well, you just must do this. You must do that. You know, there really aren't very many shoulds and musts in this life. You should breathe every so often. You must have food and water to exist. There just aren't a lot of shoulds and musts. But we certainly make a lot of them up. And if we think we're the repository of all knowledge and everything revolves around us, then we spew out a lot of these shoulds and musts, and we're awfully quick to take someone's negative inventory. Why? Because there's our way and the wrong way. We're controlling. We think, okay, we know how to do this, so you should do it the way I know it should be done. Even if you're right, maybe you're right. Maybe you do know how to do it. But there's a lot of different ways to get something done. Maybe you're a linear thinker. You go A, B, C, D, E. And maybe somebody else is not a linear thinker. Maybe they look at it and they kind of see A, F, B, C, G, Z, L. They see everything all at one time, and it all comes together at the end. It doesn't make sense to you, but it does to them. I've said before, Robin and I can walk into the same building and come out and describe it, to the same person, and you would have no idea that we walked into the same building. I would come out and say, yeah, it's a really good building. Got a good solid foundation. It's built on 12-inch centers. Got good solid beams. I think the roof is solid. Got good bones. I think it's a good building. And she would come out and say, I love the light in this building. It's got really high ceilings. It's got wide open spaces. I can see how we could do a lot of things with this. I love the outside elevation. It's got great curb appeal. You could listen to two of us and have no idea whether we were in the same building or not. We looked at it the same, but we saw it through different filters. Was I right? Yes, everything I said was accurate. Was she right? Yes, everything she said was accurate. It's just a matter of the filter through which we looked at it. There's no right way to see it. It isn't that she should see it the way I see it or that I must see it the way she saw it. And if you're a fault finder, you're going to pick up things that violate your expectation of how things should be done or how problems must be solved. And if you're really controlling, you're going to take a sick pleasure in studying someone else's negative inventory. You're going to get used to making criticisms. Let me tell you something about criticisms. If you are a fault finder, you're a bottomless pit. Because there is nothing your partner can do that's ever going to be good enough for you. They can do eight out of ten things perfectly right, and you will focus on the two things they did not get done. Instead of saying, wow, we were going to try and get ten things done today, and you knocked eight of them off the list. Great job. You'll say, well, you didn't get those two done. You know how deflating that is for somebody that always looks at the negative? You will never focus nor comment on your partner's beautiful dress or suit. Instead, you'll say, yeah, you got a scuff on your shoe. So living with you is like trying to fill a bottomless pit. They can never do enough. You're the type that will say to your partner, we had a great day together except for when you did so-and-so. You have no idea how sick to death your partner can get of your constant criticism. Even if you think I'm not describing you, You need to take a brutally honest look at yourself here, because this is an attitude that can quickly overtake you. There's something I want to tell you about the psychology of hearing things and being open. If you give somebody a constructive criticism, I mean, really, you're not trying to be negative. You're really trying to help them get a better result in their life. But it's a criticism. You see how they truly 
could sail through life easier. They truly could get their work done more efficiently. They truly could get less resistance from the kids or their teenagers if they would get out of their own way a little bit. And so you genuinely are coming from a good place. You're genuinely coming from love, and you genuinely want to help. You offer it in that spirit. Most times, it will be taken that way. And you might have a second constructive criticism. They might even ask for anything else that you think could help. And they might take that. But research has shown us that two is pretty much the limit. Because if you put defensiveness on the y-axis and number of criticisms on the x-axis, so along the x-axis that goes horizontally, you go out to one, defensiveness doesn't go up very much. You go to two, it doesn't go up very much. But you get the three, four, five, and six, your graph now looks like a hockey stick because it goes right through the roof. You pass two and they're like, all right, that's enough. I've heard all I want to hear. Their ears slam shut and it's like, okay, now we're just kicking my ass. Now we're just taking my inventory and who are you to be telling me all of this stuff? And look, I'm not trying to be Mr. Rah-Rah here where I'm telling you that the answer to life is that you think positively all the time, because that's just not true. But far too many of us can fall into criticizing, blaming, and disparaging others, and it does not help the situation because they either get discouraged or defensive. You want people to be inspired. I've always said to parents, it takes a thousand attaboys to erase one you're a rotten kid. You're no good. You're stupid. You're worthless. And you may be thinking, well, who says that to their kids? Yeah. I've done 3,000 episodes. Follow me around for 17 years and ask me that question. It happens so much, it make your stomach turn. It takes a thousand attaboys. And I'll say that to parents and they'll say, well, He's either setting the cat on fire or he's writing on the wall, tearing up something. I mean, come on. How do I support that? I don't care if you have to hide in the bushes to catch him doing something right. You stalk him. You stalk her until you catch him doing something right. And then you jump out of the bushes and give him a big hug and say, oh, thank you for being such a good boy. Thank you for being such a good girl. You don't reward bad behavior, but you catch them doing something right. And maybe it's that you catch them sitting still for a minute. Maybe it's that you catch them watching something on TV or reading something off of an iPad for a second. You just catch them in those few seconds of not being destructive. Pounce on them and love them up. You want to inspire people, and you don't do it by criticism. You do it by finding something they did well, and they want to please you. They want to go find something else they can do. So how do you know whether or not you're a fault finder? Well, like I said before, I gave you a few check-ins that you can do with yourself. Number one, you seldom, if ever, let an infraction by your partner just slide by, regardless of how trivial it is. Just ask yourself. Do you seldom, if ever, just let something slide? You know, maybe they screwed up. Maybe they said something wrong. Maybe they stepped on your toes, hurt your feelings, did something they said they weren't going to do. Do you seldom, if ever, just let that slide by? Because you can, you know. You don't have to respond or react every time you can. You don't have to. It's your choice. You can just let it go. Do you find yourself saying things to your partner? that have, should, and must in the sentence. Do you use the words always and never when criticizing your partner? You always do this. You never help. You always ignore me. When you use these absolutes, always and never, that's very disheartening to your partner. Next, you tend to complain about how you're not getting what you deserve or that life is unfair to you. And this is an attitude that you quickly transfer to your partner as if he or she is in charge. They're to blame. It's the old joke about 
somebody meant to say, would you pass the toast? And it came out, you ruined my life, you rotten human being. That's how they hear it. You think life isn't going well, and you blame who's handy. They're a perfect target. You transfer that to your partner. Do you counterattack with criticism whenever you're being criticized? Your partner, for example, tells you, hey, you forgot to take out the trash last night. And instead of hearing the message, your competitive attitude and critical spirit kicks in and you counterattack. I can't believe you have the nerve to say that. You never do what you're supposed to. You don't want to do that. And lastly, you are obsessively interested in getting your partner to admit to wrongdoing rather than listening to what they have to say. You're a fault finder, so you need them to admit fault. If you're controlled by this bad spirit and think your critical perfectionism is making your partner a better person, you need to think again, because it doesn't. It just simply doesn't make them a better person. It deflates them. I grew up in sports. I had coaches that would grab me by the face mask and pull me up there and say, son, you can do better. I know you can. I've seen you do it. I know you can do it. And I believed him. He believed in me, so I believed in me. And I've had coaches grab that same face mask and say, you are the laziest excuse for a human being I've ever seen. I don't know why your daddy fed you. Well, that doesn't exactly inspire me to want to go out and do better. And you would ask that second coach why you would say that. So I'm just trying to motivate him, trying to make him want to do better. Well, you got a funny way of doing it because that does not enhance your self-esteem. It does not make you feel better about yourself. You do not believe the people that are coaching you believe in you. And it sticks in your internal dialogue. You are not going to criticize and put somebody down and they're going to feel challenged and all of a sudden just become a better person. I learned that in sports. You don't have to be in sports to learn it. You can just let me tell you because I've experienced it and I can attest to it. Characteristic three of the bad spirit is so obvious. You think it's your way or the highway. This is so obvious I don't need to spend much time on it. Your objective is not just to dominate, to manage your partner with condescension and intimidation, but to stake out the moral high ground. You seek to set up a hierarchy, a pecking order. You're in charge. You're the smartest person in the room. You're in control. And if it fails, you'll blame them, even though you're the one in charge. You're the one running it. But when it fails, you'll blame them because they didn't listen. I've talked to so many people that have this attitude, their way or the highway. And my question to them is always, if you're so smart, why is this off in the ditch? You're running this marriage. You got all of the answers. You're giving all the criticisms. If you're so smart, why are you sitting in my office in marital therapy with your wife contemplating different ways to get away from you? If you're so smart, why is this not working? You're in control. You're in charge. Well, she just won't listen. Well, no, no, no. You're the smart one. You should be smart enough to get her to listen, right? You're in control. You're the dominant force. So dominant forces are able to get people to do what they want to do. Well, she just won't listen. So you're not in control. Then why don't you shut up? Since it's evident that what you're doing isn't working, why don't you practice on shutting up and let somebody else talk? Well, we just need to find a new therapist. Well, yeah, you do, because I don't much care to talk to you. So if you're one of those people that think it's your way or the highway, you control the money, you control the time, you control every aspect. You're going to be lonely. Lonely. Because people are going to get away from you as fast as they can. You say it's my way or the highway, <laughs> they're going to choose the highway. Trust me, they will drive, walk, hitchhike, run, whatever. They'll choose the highway every time before they listen to your dogmatic ass. For sure, they will get away from you. So how do you know if you're this person? Well, number one, you're intolerant of your partner's initiatives or ideas. They all got to be you. You don't listen to them. You're just intolerant. They got a thought, an idea. Nope, nope, nope. Number two. Ask yourself this, do you regularly interrupt your partner during conversations so that you can get in what you want to say instead of patiently allowing your partner to finish their thought? 
Because why waste time listening to them? You're the one with all the answers. You're the smartest person in the room, so why would you waste time listening to them? Number three, you change the game on those few occasions when you realize that your partner is actually making a good point. So you might say to your partner, for instance, well, you don't have to use that tone of voice. They're making a good point, so you've got to get out of the situation so they're not actually edifying themselves. Instead of solving the problem, you've got to say, I don't like your tone of voice. What they were saying made sense, so you've got to pick on the way they're saying it. You change the game. Number four, you cannot end a confrontation until your partner acknowledges that you're right. Number five, if your partner won't admit the rightness of your position, you tend to talk or act like a martyr, making sure your partner understands that you just don't feel appreciated. Well, no matter what I do, it's not enough. You just don't get it. You just don't get it. I try. I work. I just... Oh, it's just, it's, it's, I, I just can't do enough. I just can't please you. You regularly assume a saintly, pious position with friends and family, telling them all you have to put up with concerning your impossible partner. And my favorite, you tend to start sentences with guilt-inducing phrases like, if you loved me, if you cared for me, Or I told you so, you should have listened. That's your bad spirit at its next to ugliest. It's not quite the ugliest, but it's next to ugliest. So what's the ugliest? It's when you turn into an attack dog. Now, this characteristic is so easy to trigger and so hard to undo. How many times have you started out discussing an issue? You know, you just start out, let's just have a conversation. And you end up ripping into your partner with a personal attack. You think you're going to stay in control. We're just going to have a discussion here. But very soon, you suddenly bail out on the topic. It just goes by the wayside. Whatever it was you were talking about, it just gets pushed to the side and gives way to personal attacks, character assassination. You might have been talking about money, shopping, parenting, planning for summer. It doesn't matter what the topic was. But very early on, that gets pushed away, and you start undermining the confidence and self-worth of your partner. You get vicious. And when viciousness gets out of hand, and it does, This cherished partner, this person that you supposedly love, is beaten down. It's a verbal whipping. Sometimes it goes beyond that. Sometimes it becomes physical violence. Sometimes it gets even worse than that. But usually, it's just a verbal beatdown. The message is clear. I want to hurt you. They know it. You know it. Sometimes it's blatant and recognizable. And make no mistake, you'll know what buttons to push. If you're wanting to go on the attack, you'll know what buttons to push. You know what they're sensitive about. You know what hurts them. Maybe your husband had a father that was domineering and overbearing, maybe even violent. And you can start out talking about planning for finances. But early on, it's you're just like your father. Now, you know that is the last person in the world he wants to be like. You know that will get to him. And so you go there. You say, you're just like your father. And in a flash, it's all out war. You find yourself saying things like, how could you be so selfish? Are you ever going to quit being so self-absorbed and ignoring your children, ignoring your wife, ignoring your husband? The message is clear. The damage is done. And believe you me, that is a hard bell to unring. How do you know if you're falling into this? I think it's pretty clear, but I'll give you some checkpoints just to be sure. Number one, your interactions are marked at least by a very harsh tone of voice and often by in-your-face shouting. Two, your interactions are marked by such body language as a curled upper lip, pointed fingers in the face, 
or that Clint Eastwood killer stare, or exaggerated mocking eye rolls. Your comments are laden with condescension, such as, Well, you really turned out to be a great catch, didn't you? Or your comments are full of insults and name-calling, from bitch and bastard to fat and ugly. I mean, it's just pure character assassination. Your comments are filled with you statements, such as, you make me sick, you disgust me, you are stupid, you are worthless. And as I said, you push those buttons in vulnerable areas. And lastly, as opposed to an act of overt commission, you withhold from your partner that which you know they want and need to have peace in your life. And all of this is because you seek to manage them with intimidation, both physical, mental, and emotion. You're just trying to overwhelm them, overbear them. It's management by intimidation, and that never works. Now, there's a flip side to this in your face. There's a part of the bad spirit that instead of you turning into an attack dog, you turn into a passive warmonger. You've all heard about passive-aggressive. Passive-aggressive people are those that will sabotage you. They'll try to make things hard. Like, you don't want to help do the dishes, so just break a few. It's like, here, just give me that. We've only got so many dishes. Just give me that. Just go on. You're passive-aggressive. You don't say you don't want to do it. You just do such a bad job that you get out of it. Passive-aggressive people just don't understand. You can have a passive-aggressive person at work. They don't want you to have gotten the supervisor position. So when you're trying to explain a new system or program, they just don't get it. I'm sorry. You're confusing me. I just don't get it. I'm I'm sorry. I'm I'm trying. I just don't get it. So they'll make you spend two and a half hours explaining something that should have taken 20 minutes. And then the boss comes around and says, well, have you finished all these other things? No, I'm still doing this. Two and a half hours and you're still doing this? It should have taken 20 minutes. Yeah, well, they passive-aggressively got you because they sabotaged you all along. And you ask them, oh, I'm trying. I, I'm, thank you for your patience. So here are some telltale signs as to whether or not you, whether you admit it or not, are a passive warmonger. After listening to your partner make a suggestion, you agree with the suggestion And then a few minutes later, start talking about why it will fail rather than how it could succeed. You agree with it to their face, but then before it even gets started, you start finding fault and talking about how it's going to come apart. Like I just said about the person at work, you feign confusion when your partner explains even simple rationales for changing something in your relationship that you happen to like. You feign ineptness over activities that you just don't like whether it's painting the room or watching the kids or doing the dishes. You time vague and subjectively defined illnesses to come up with competing events to interfere with plans made by your partner that you didn't like. They've put something together that they want to do and you didn't, and just when it's time to do it, oh my God, I've got this horrible stomach bug. You don't admit it. You don't say, look, I don't want to go. Like when I told Robin, I don't want to go to your sister's. I'll just tell you now, I don't want to go. If you're going to be mad, tell me now. Let's work it out now. Instead, if I was a passive warmonger, when it came time to go, I could have just said, oh my gosh, I've got a terrible stomach bug and just sabotage the trip. And the one that drives me the most crazy, drives any therapist crazy, is the yow butt. We call them the yow butt patients. No matter what you say, they listen and go, yeah, but what about this? They can come in and say, well, yeah, I've got this teenage son, and they cuss and call me names all the time. So you can sit down with the child, and you can say, okay, it's not very becoming to you, and I know you're better than that, so let's make a commitment That instead of name calling and instead of cussing, you're going to require more of yourself and we're not going to do that anymore. Let's role play some ways that we're going to handle those frustrations instead. And we'll role play that. Then they'll go home for a week and do a great job and come back the next week and say, what happened? Say, well, 
didn't call a single name, didn't cuss a single time. So how you feel about that, Mom? Yeah, but, you know, how long is it going to last? Well, <laughs> I don't know, but it lasted a week, and you hadn't been able to get past a single day for the last three years, and we just got a week. That's progress, isn't it? Yeah, but you just don't know her. You get a kid that is just not doing their schoolwork, and they're flunking out of school, and you can get them to say, listen, you can get more out of your parents by doing this schoolwork than you could ever steal by sneaking out the window and trying to go around the edges. So I'm going to appeal to your greed here. You're really smart. Let's just turn in the homework. It's 40% of your grade. You know you can do the test. And so then they come back and say, well, they went from C's to A's. Yeah, but they're just doing it to manipulate me. Well, what do you care? They learned the stuff. They went through the semester with straight A's, and they're only doing it to make you happy? Yeah, but that's not a real thirst for knowledge. <sighs> that's the passive-aggressive warmonger. Ask yourself, are you a yeah, but partner? And if you are, boy, oh boy, oh boy, you got to ask yourself, what's the payoff? Now, there are other characteristics. I could go on with this forever, but those are the key elements of the bad spirit. Some of the others, you just will not forgive no matter what. You're a bottomless pit, doesn't matter what they do. You're never satisfied. You get so comfortable in the relationship that you're just lazy. You don't put anything into it. Or maybe the worst one of all, you've just given up. Your bad spirit is expressed by you've just given up. You know, this isn't ever going to change. I, I've just given up. I've checked out. I'm just putting in my time. I'm wanting you to take your own inventory. I'm wanting you to say, am I contaminating this situation? I'm spending so much time on this because I believe that we either contribute to or contaminate every relationship we're in. There is no neutrality. There is no middle ground. You enter into a relationship based on your learning history, and whatever you bring with you, whatever choices you make, you either contribute to the health of the relationship or you contaminate the health of that relationship. And if your bad spirit is in control, then you are contaminating that relationship. And all you have to do is stop doing those things. Your partner doesn't have to do anything. You just have to stop letting your bad spirit control you. And if you do nothing but that, you're going to see a substantial improvement in your relationship. Now think about this. You rid yourself of the myths that we talked about the two weeks before the last week, and you rid yourself of these bad spirits. You choose to behave differently. Do you not think just those things, no longer laboring under those myths and ridding yourself of this bad spirit are going to make a substantial difference in the health, pleasure, joy, and satisfaction of your relationship, whether your partner does anything or not? And the answer is yes. We'll talk more about this. I'm Dr. Phil. Phil. 